in mourning along with the rest of the world as we react to the MH17 tragedy and our thoughts are very much with the friends and families of the victims and of course through social media we feel sympathy with greater impact than ever before and this morning we're joined by family therapist Karen Phillip and journalist Angela Moller to discuss this. Welcome to you both. Uh, after the news broke social media was inundated with public reaction and uh, Karen people do feel the effects of this even more personal. Uh, for instance the, the pictures of those three children mm. particularly drive this tragedy home to me because I think any parent puts the faces of their own children we do. across those images we and, do. and it's uh, it's almost unbearable to look at. I think all of us have the same feeling that I do now. It, your stomach is just turning mm. and, and we are grieving and the fact is that social media allows us to be part of this event, part of all events now and it's bringing it very close to home. We knew that there was war going on over there, we knew that people were being killed but now it's at home and it affects us very personally and very differently when it does arrive home. Mm. And as you say, we, we see the pictures of those children, and even though my children are much older now, uh, it's them. Yeah. It could be them. Mm. And this is the situation. And I think it's also the way that media unfolds now. You used to open a newspaper in the morning and there'd be a delay, there'd be 12 hours between stories happening and, and yeah. the reporting of them. The same way that when we started in journalism camp, to get a picture of, of a deceased in a tragedy like this, you would have to go through the police. So there was always time to sort of assimilate your emotions. Now with citizen journalism and every you know Instagram account, Facebook, pe children's pictures, you know the views we've had from the inside of, of, of the cabin, it's just an ordinary cabin, but it takes on a greater resonance when you're looking at it knowing that that cabin no longer exists and I think what we need to do in these situations and particularly people with children like you know I have 10 and 13 year old last time we flew my daughter was very scared about flying because of the previous Malaysian Airlines flight is to actually show them the good news stories as well. The, the very early pictures from this disaster uh, were some of them were very graphic mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, and there was an outrage from people saying look the dignity of these people has to be preserved, mm. have some respect yes. well, the for fact the people who have lost their lives. Do you think yes. that there is enough respect being shown? Well, at the moment, the, the bodies are still there. Now, they're saying that they need to leave that, them that, there. That, that's, a, that's an official request from crash scene investigators because they want those bodies left in situ, as difficult as that is, because they, they, it helps them go through the analysis of what happened. But I, I just I just asked the, the Russian ambassador, how long? How long do they have to lay there? I mean, how the dignity of, of the people that we love and care for, uh, and even our fellow Australians, let alone the rest of the, the, the people on the plane, it's, we feel it so personally and we want to show them dignity, we want to, to remove them from, from that area. Mm. Uh, and, and I understand what they're saying, that they need to investigate, but... Well, there is a fear, isn't there, Angela, that these separatists and controlled by Russia may not allow a proper investigation. Well, that's what Judy Fisher was saying this morning, mm. is that we need to get the United, yeah, uh, United Nations Security Council in to secure that site. You need to be there so that those investigators can do it impartially, but then you've got this, this war situation. And what this is highlighted to us is that if we are going to be global citizens and we are going to fly, then we're happy, actually going to have to be more knowledgeable and up, to, and up to date. You know, we heard about Ukraine several months ago and most of it just it just fell off our radar. We need to be informed and to stay across these subjects. And I think, you know, if the upshot from these situations is, is that we do care more and we do have a greater worldwide concern, then that's a good thing. There's a dreadful feeling with all of this that the world is changing and it's beyond our control it's changing so fast and that, that you know we're losing the you know the good things in the world too quickly mm. but uh, look mm. think things life does have to go on and we move now to the Catholic teachers who next week uh, 200 schools will strike against the latest pay structure and for the first time they will be paid based on standards not on their years of service Angela, to you, do you think this action is justified? Well, as a parent, a, a school strike always drives me nuts, obviously. <laughs> but coming from a family of teachers, I understand why they need to take that action. They need to be heard and they need to discuss it. That said, I think the teaching profession needs to move. We need to look at merit. We need to look at performance-based incentives. It's one of those, um, you know, I, I uphold teachers and applaud them. Most of them work very, very well. But in any industry, your industry, my industry, you are paid according to 
to how well you do it. And yes. we need to move It's not that. just time on the no, block. No, it's yeah. not. And that's, I think it needs to it change. Needs it to really does. And and you, you've got teachers in the classroom, one doing extracurricular activities, they're doing sport, they're doing music, they're doing choir. Mm. And the other teacher really is just going in nine to three mm. to do their work, but they both get the same. Yes, and, and, and also the difference equity. it makes to our children is that you can a good teacher can advance you two years in a single year, yes. whereas studies have shown that a poor teacher will you'll only make six months of that curriculum mm. that year. So there's a pronounced difference and uh, they need to respond to it. And it's, it's been a question for a long time. Do you rent <laughs> or do you buy? Uh, circumstances, of course, are changing uh, all the time. But a study has shown that real house prices have risen by 2.4% a year since 1955. And there are now concerns that buying will not provide the returns it used to. So, ladies, which side of the fence do you sit in? Do you sit on? Do you would you prefer to rent or or own? What returns are we talking about? Are we talking about the returns of planting yourself, putting the roots down for your family, so the landlord can't come along and say, "Oh, you've got to go in three months or, or two weeks." We're talking about our roots and our basis for our family, and I don't think there's a price on that. Mm. Uh, admittedly, living around the inner city is very difficult, but I'm all for buying. Uh, uh, all for buying. Right from an early age, uh, you know, our parents tell us that property is a great investment, mm. that it always goes up, that it's where you mm. should have most of your capital. Mm. Uh, what if we have to reassess that? Yeah, well, look, I'm a massive hypocrite on this, Cam, because I love my house and I love and I, I love the ownership of it and the, and the kind of sense of belonging that it um, that it gives. And I'm a block aficionado, so I love watching all these programs, as we've seen with the ratings. That said, I have a globe on my desk, and sometimes I look at that globe and I think, this is stopping me seeing that. Yeah, yeah. And that's, you know what, I sometimes wish you could liquidate some of your capital to just go and live out in the world and that's the problem we have so much money tied up in our homes that we then pass on to our children what good's that really doing them so I'd love mm. to be able to go halfway between and I know the um, reverse mortgage situation is that what oh, no, you yeah. don't go there. But that, don't that's go so there. dodgy you know, so, you don't go there. so how can you have both that is what, that's what I want to teach my children is how can you have things that you own and love but still never compromise well, life is a series of economic choices <laughs> damn it. But the fact is that it's so hard for our young people to get into the market and I, I place the, that on the government with the stamp duty. I mean it's mm. average. Mm. The stamp duty hasn't changed since 1986 when the medium house price was $87,000. Now we've got the same percentages of stamp duty and the medium house price is what $650,000. So we're paying between thirty-five dollars and $40,000 mm. for a first home. I mean, this is insane. Yeah, That's our deposit. So I, I reckon I've got a resolution. Mm. We get rid of the, the stamp duty for the first homeowners and we double the stamp duty for our overseas investors. There we go. Why are you right, not working for the does. government? <laughs> and uh, rent your house out and go back back. And That's my suggestion. Oh, OK. Excellent. <laughs> back to you, Deb. Solve the world problems. <laughs> One little issue at a time, don't you?